Hi, I'm Dylan Richards. In New York, we have the United Nations and the best food from all over the world. Follow me as I search for the healthiest food in the five boroughs on Dylan's Lunchbox. More crunch. Very soon. Pop it out Juices and the oranges can start to come out of it. Flagship cheese. Here's your burger. Fly the opposite way. I'm Tanya Sokova for Jones Lunchbox. And how you got into organic farming? About American cuisine. Who doesn't love Italian food? Chinese food is one of the oldest cuisines in the world. We're here to find out what's in your lunchbox. We have already learned about eating local, but there's another great trend in fresh food called farm to table. Many restaurants work closely with local farms and gardens to get the best ingredients in town, which means an excellent dining experience. This week I'm going to check out the popular East Village restaurant Northern Spy Food Co. to see how they not only cook great food, but also find top notch ingredients. So come on, let's get our hands dirty. Welcome to Bissell Gardens. This is a garden that stretches over eight blocks um, around the, metro, the MTA train yard. So this is a decommissioned city street that through the help of community advocates who will get to me, we have turned into a garden. So come on in. Everything was built here from the ground up. This is all done with resourced and reclaimed material. We've created a place for people to congregate in holy, healthy manners. It's about community, it's about involvement, it's about engagement. But at the end of the day, food's a non-negotiable. We all got to eat. So we're going to start growing plants on a wall, off the wall, and use this sun um, to generate beautiful plants that I could eat in the morning like this. Uh, mm, delicioso. And that is a really good tomato. During World War II, you know, 40% of the produce in the United States was grown in victory gardens. So here in the 21st century, we are growing our way into a new economy. We're feeding hundreds of people here without a food stamp or a fingerprint. This used to be a den of prostitution and stolen cars. It was a recipe for disaster. No one gets arrested here. This is a weed-free zone um, because we're growing vegetables. And show well, a little bit of love and a whole lot of patience, you know, people could get done. And what we wanted to do is create a very public, open space for kids and schools to come. It's really about creating safe spaces within a community that also allows for education. I had a very different vision for all of this, but the fact that the community owns it is, is great. Any person who wants to garden in the Bronx can come here. Just to see things grow and you can reap it and you can donate it, you can use it, then that's very rewarding for the community. We just don't do it once and it's finished. No, no, no. Every single bit of food that's grown here is donated to a shelter or a soup kitchen or to the farmer's market locally up the block, which we have our own farmer's market. We got Bronxberry fresh here. We got great raspberries coming. We got beautiful grapes. I mean, look at these Bronx tomatoes. Who needs Jersey tomatoes? We got Bronx tomatoes. This is the Bronx, you're in the hood. Now you may not know it right here, right now, but two blocks in and three blocks over, you know, you're under the train. And to imagine that you're gardening under a train in New York City is, is rather remarkable. Long before we were growing vegetables, people need to learn work skills. They need a place where they can show up and grow up. So I was taking high school kids, um, many of whom came with a lot of obstacles and a lot of baggage, and giving them the opportunity to get some hands-on learning that actually translated into employable skills, and also reclaiming property in ways that are just amazing. Because this was bad. This was 35 dumpsters of trash that came out of here. The Bronx has been through a lot of changes. For those of us who are old enough to remember when it was burning, well, there's nothing burning here anymore. Um, and a lot of guys came back from the war, Vietnam veterans, and got involved. Um, a, with the VA hospital, but find this therapeutic. It's relaxing. Nobody hassles you. You know, we come out and you see big piles of chips, and you come out and you just spread it out so it looks good. We pick up all the paper every morning. As a kid, I grew up sort of gardening in the afternoon, and I hated it. But I learned the skill, so I know how it's done, and now I'm, I'm sort of hooked on it. Kids need adults to look up to, and they need to see adults doing positive things, and here we are doing positive things. It's about leadership, it's about patience, it's about stick to -itiveness. it's about a lot of things that nurture and nature combine together to build a community and to create a mindset that's wholly transformative. 
welcome to Brook Park, a happy, happy place with happy, happy kids. This was cement, and the kids sat here for a summer and broke the cement to get out here, to build this. Every single thing you see here, we found in the street and reclaimed it and reused it and rebuilt it. People who farm here, farm and feed their families here. It's, it's, it's touching. Good morning, my little chickens. What comes first, the chicken or the egg? I don't know, but uh, we're glad to have chickens here in the South Bronx and every kid gets the opportunity to feed them, get in the cage and play with them. If people could get along like the chickens, it would be a much better world. It's a very healing environment. You can see it in terms of just how the young person begins to just relate with themselves, that they're calmer and they're more open to speaking. The big debate in underserved communities is the lack of access to fresh fruits and vegetables. The debate really needs to incorporate responsibility for you eating in a better way. It's a known fact. You grow the food, you're gonna eat it. It's just easier to raise healthy children than it is to fix broken men. This park has saved more lives. It's open 24 hours a day. People are here. We have a library. We have a kennel for the dogs. We have parties. We have weddings. But most importantly, we have community and access to healthy, fresh food. Here, we are reshaping and reclaiming our destiny. One garden, one block, you know, one community, one child, one plant at a time. Somewhere over the rainbow is the South Bronx of America. Hi, I'm Stephanie Sachs. I'm a culinary nutritionist, trained as a chef by the Masters in Nutrition, and I'm a certified nutrition specialist. And today we're gonna to talk about herbs and spices, specifically cilantro. I had a horrible relationship with cilantro many years ago, but now I love it. I had to work with it a little too often when I was uh, cooking in a health food store. And the smell was so pungent that it turned me off. However, understanding a little bit more about this herb has helped me because it's an incredible digestive aid. It has incredible blood cleansing properties. And it actually, in small quantities, can be really, really delicious in so many different foods. So today, what we're gonna do is we are gonna make a chimichurri. Now, chimichurri is a native Argentinian sauce that's typically made with parsley and garlic and, and different herbs and spices. This is my version, which is uh, cilantro with some curry and some red pepper and some garlic and some olive oil. It's a great sauce that can be used as a dip, just like a lot of the herb sauces. It can be used as a marinade uh, for vegetables, to grill vegetables. It can be used on chicken, which I'll show you today. So here we go. I like to shave my herbs instead of sitting here and picking them like this, which can be extremely laborious, which can turn anybody off from using herbs and spices, is the process in which you need to go through to get them to a culinary state. Honestly, we can eat the stems just as much as we can eat the leaves. Here we have a miniature Cuisinart. Great tool, I think necessary. $40, you can get it pretty much anywhere. And put your cilantro in, and we've got some garlic. I'm gonna smash garlic here. So it loosens up the skin, so you don't have to peel the skin off. It can go in whole because we're mashing it. And we've got some curry powder. I'm gonna take this top off here and scoop in some curry. And chimichurri is typically quite spicy, so you can control the heat on it however you'd wish. So I'm gonna put some crushed red pepper in here, just like so. Okay, and we're gonna finish it with some olive oil. Quite a bit of olive oil because again, it is a marinade, so we need to add more. Let's see what that looks like. Looks pretty good. I'm just going to add a little bit of salt. And a little salt can go a long way in uh, marinades like this. You have a lot of flavors with the herbs and the spices, so you really don't need too much salt. And that's the beautiful thing about using herbs and spices. Oftentimes, we're so accustomed to using salt to season our foods. Let's turn to some fresh herbs and some spices, which will give us medicinal benefits instead of just putting salt on our food for flavor all the time. So here we have our chimichurri. You can see it's kind of a, a beautiful green yellow. And I've got some boneless chicken breast right here. Greatest way to marinate meats, in my opinion, is to just put them in a plastic bag. 
I will often clean them with lemon and salt, rinse them under water, and then just spoon the marinade right in to the chicken, like so. And you can let this sit overnight, and all you're gonna do is mix it around, so it kinda just looks like this. And then your chicken, your tofu, your vegetables, your fish, your meat, will take on the fabulous flavor of this chimichurri. So enjoy. So here we have our finished chimichurri chicken. All I did was I put the chicken in the pan, didn't add any additional oil because we had the oil in the marinade, and it marinated in a plastic bag for not very long at all. Look at the beautiful color. And I cooked it in the saute pan on a medium heat for roughly eight minutes. So now I'm gonna taste it. Take a piece right here. Lots of flavor. You can always add salt at the end. Throw the chicken on top of the salad with additional fresh herbs in the salad. So there we have it, chimichurri chicken. It's delicious. If you are looking for some healthy snacks to take with you when you're on the go, you need to check out some of these options. Frozen grapes are a nice treat with high water content to keep you hydrated and high fiber to keep you feeling full. Roasted chickpeas taste great, are portable, and have lots of protein. Dry plums have vitamin A and B6, and are a good source of fiber and antioxidants. A small bag of whole grain cereal could provide the nutritious pick-me-up you need while you are on the go. Shell peanuts and pistachios can be a portable little snack filled with fiber and protein. Armed with these healthy ordinances, you can destroy hunger on the go. I'm Chef Bobo, Executive Chef and Director of Food Service at the Calhoun School. And I'm here to help kids learn what real food is about. What brought me here was parents wanting their kids to eat better. On the top of the school, we have a green roof and we have a garden on that green roof. When we installed the roof in 2004, it, people just really didn't know what to do with it. So uh, after a year or so of people not doing anything with it, we said, okay, we're gonna go up and start planting food up there. It's, it's not here just for the beauty, but also for the educational opportunities that it provides us. As you can imagine with New York City kids, they come up here and they don't know what any of this is. This is just green. It has not, they don't know how to relate it to food because they don't realize that food comes from here. So we're able to use this in teaching kids where food comes from. This is the Lower School Veggie Garden, and um, it's something that I've worked on with all the students, especially third and fourth grade students. We planted this kale from seed in the fall and then grew them in our greenhouse over the winter and then transplanted them to this garden as soon as it got warm enough. So that was one way that the second graders and third graders learned about seed germination was by doing that. With the fourth graders, they start to learn about um, global warming and greenhouse gases. And so what I did this year is I connected that to um, where their food comes from. So they could you know, find out that getting your food from far away produces a lot of greenhouse gases, whereas if you can grow your own food, then you, you don't contribute towards that problem. You can see we have some beautiful flowering arugula here. And I don't know if you know it, but the arugula flowers are even more delicious than the arugula itself. We have lattices, we have horseradish. This is all flowering beds. Here we have some carrots coming up, beets, garlic, and radishes coming here. This is our blueberry bush. Look, we're getting some blueberries, pear trees. In the corner, we have beautiful lavender growing, which you can use as a seasoning. And then we have a lawn, and we insist kids take off their shoes to walk on the lawn so they can play on it and enjoy being outdoors. This is our schoolyard, really. What we put in here are apple cores, snacks from kids, and they come in, they turn it, and they use this compost to fertilize the, the bed over in the corner. They're so proud of this garden that when you bring them up here to just talk, if they want a snack, they go over and pick the kale and pick the lettuce to chew on. They're that comfortable with it. They, they've taken ownership of that's real food 
I did that and that's healthy and that's what I want to eat. We were serving multicolored cauliflower for lunch. We had purple and golden and white cauliflower. And the kids were coming in saying, Chef Bobo, why did you dye the cauliflower? I said, we didn't, it grows purple. So the learning moment was there that, that cauliflower can come up purple and white and yellow. And uh, they saw for themselves that it, that it can actually happen. And, and it got them interested in what's going on up here. In New York City, kids don't really have that much awareness of you know, where their food comes from as much as maybe children who are out on a farm or living in some other place. So they're learning, there's the si educational, the science aspect of it. There's also the health aspects because they're, you know, learning how it's healthier to eat fresh food rather than prepackaged food. What we're going to make today is a parsley lemon pesto. Has anyone had pesto? As in, like an Italian restaurant? No, it's like a sauce, kind of and you put it on pasta or a sandwich. Usually it's made with another herb called basil, but today we're doing something a little bit different and we're gonna make it with parsley. We need one quarter cup of lemon juice. You wanna fill the whole cup up and then she's gonna pour it into the blender. Oh. Uh. Next thing on our, on our ingredients list is one small clove of garlic. Just take your palm and smack it. There you go. <laughs> Nobody said cookie was clean. All right, just chop it up a little bit. This is called a flatbread. What they're learning is how much better food is in its original form, where it came from. It's a really important part of what we do. Did you know that corn is the most widely grown crop in the world? In fact, more than 800 billion tons of the stuff is produced each year. That's like enough popcorn to fill up one of the Great Lakes. Food wouldn't exist as we know it today if it weren't for corn. That's a lot from a little grain that wasn't even available in Europe until the 16th century. Nearly half the corn grown in the United States goes to feeding livestock. Because corn is dense and high in calories, it fattens livestock like cows a lot quicker than a natural diet of grass. This means more cheap beef, but it also means more unhealthy cows, which can lead to more unhealthy beef. I'm with celebrity yoga instructor Gwen Lawrence. What do we have to do today? Today we're going to do hero's pose. So you're going to come to the front of your mat. All right. And level one, very simple, is you're just going to have the toes untucked and sit back on your heels and see how that feels. Believe it or not, this is hard for some people of tight ankles, maybe um, people that wear high heels a lot, which isn't you, but some other people. If this feels OK, which you're really good at, then you're going to separate the feet. And you're going to start to think about sitting between the feet. Good. Now before you go any further, what's really important here is that our knees are in line with each other and that the bottom of your foot is always facing up. You never want to see this kind of position because that's really damaging for the knee. Mm -hmm. So you look perfect right now. And you are really good at this one. You could maybe start to feel quads. Some people feel quads. Right. Some people feel shin. Maybe I even top of the, the ankle, foot. Right okay. ankle. A lot of people feel that first and then eventually you'll feel some um, quad stuff too. And then maybe you can go back to your hands. Good, maybe you can go all the way back. You can go all the way back. And then you can bring your arms overhead and grab opposite elbow. And this too, you wanna to stay here a minute, two minutes. You feel the quads now or still ankles? Ankles. Okay. Nice deep breathing. If you have any back problems, you don't wanna do this. If you've had recent knee surgery, you might not wanna do this either until you have a doctor's permission. But to come out nice and slow, come onto your hands and knees. Stretch one leg back at a time. You're gonna need a little time to get out of it. But a real good one for overall legs, wakes the legs up, ankles, like you said, quads, and a little bit of hips too. So in addition to all the other stuff I'm telling you, you could add this one to your daily yoga routine too.
If you're on the go and in the need of a healthy snack, consider grabbing some peanuts. Each year, more than 2.3 million tons are grown in the United States. They're easy, simple, sustainable, and full of healthy nutrients. They're packed with vitamins, proteins, and fiber, and they make you feel more full than greasy potato chips or sweet candy. Not to mention, they're also great in a number of dishes. These days, everyone is talking about farm fresh food. The farm to table movement has exploded around healthy eating and lessening our impact on the environment. But with all the positive talk, does the dish really live up to the hype? We're here at Northern Spy Food Company to find out. Since 2009, they have been one of the most popular farm fresh restaurants in the Lower East Side. And they boast a unique menu that changes with what's good and what's in season. So let's go inside and check it out. So what defines the Farm Fresh movement? What defines it is that we uh, put as much effort as we can right. into finding locally sourced products, uh, sustainably uh, produced products. Um, we find as much of those as we can and we try to put it on the menu whenever we can. Why does it matter where your food comes from? It matters because it matters to farmers, it matters to communities, it matters to uh, people's health, it matters to environment environmental health, um, kind of matters to everything. So how often do you change your menu? It never really completely entirely changes from one day to the next, but every season, probably about four times a year, a big portion of it moves off as new products come in. That tends to happen more in the late spring, summer, and fall when there's a lot of produce and things are coming in a lot. Do you think your clientele is inclined to the healthy aspects that your restaurant offers? We get a lot of people who, are, who love our kale salad, for instance, which is a really nice, healthy salad. Right. Um, but we get a lot of people who come here also for biscuits and gravy. Compared to a lot of trendy restaurants, you have a very rustic feeling. Does that reflect how your food is? The current menu kind of came, evolved after the place was built. Um, so I think we actually meant the food to be a little bit more rustic. But then we sort of enjoyed what we were doing so much, right. and we got such a, you know, we got this new chef, Hadley Schmidt, who's so awesome, does really pretty refined stuff. So we're sort of like, uh, we kind of like, I like to think that we're sandbagging people. We bring them into this kind of rustic setting, and right. we give them food that's, you know, even better than, you know, than they might expect. So what am I going to be trying today? Oh, we have a whole bunch of stuff for you. I think we're going to be um, working on the beet salad, and right. I think some gnocchi, and a lamb dish. Yummy. Let's so. go in the kitchen. All right, let's, let's go check it So what are we cooking today? Uh, we're gonna do a beet salad. Okay. Uh, our beets are coming from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. We have staying a, local. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a variety of different beets here. These are bull's blood beets. Okay. Uh, Hamlin beet. So we roasted these for about an hour and a half for at 400 degrees. Just kind of use our fingers peel and, and peel them. Okay. Uh, once we peel them, cut them into chunks. Get those. We juice some of the other beets and marinate these overnight. Great. Uh, red wine vinegar. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a light pickle uh, marinade. We also have uh, classic golden beets here, and as, as well we have candy stripe uh, beets. Uh, each kind of gets their own marinade. These have Fuji apple juice, local from a farmer's market as well. Once we've marinated overnight, yep. we drain the beet off, a couple of each. And we have the sherry vinaigrette, extra okay. virgin olive oil, sherry, and then a little salt and pepper. So once you get them roasted and, and peeled, uh, it's pretty easy to come together. A simple arrangement on the plate. What we do with the marinade is add a little uh, touch of sugar and a touch of lemon juice and freeze it into a, a sorbet. sorbet. Wow. This adds a little bit more of that sweet and sour aspect. And then over here we have goat's yogurt. Uh, we picked this up at the farmer's market. It's coming from upstate. And that we go on top. Beet marinade. And that just adds a little bit uh, more concentrated uh, flavor. A little crisp, lettuce around the outside. A little crisp freshness, exactly. And that's it. That's our big wow. salad. So, what'd you say the most popular dish is? Uh, most certainly, our most popular dish is kale salad. Also a, uh, local, very very healthy. Yeah. I'm marinated with some lemon vinaigrette. We got almonds, cheddar cheese, and roasted squash. Pretty pretty quick and simple. Very yeah. very healthy. So can you tell me about all the delicious dishes that you prepared for me today? Yeah, you bet. Really simple squash soup uh, with northern spy apples in a compost with wheat toast and curry oil. Potato gnocchi uh, from Blooming Hill Farm Potatoes. We make in the gnocchi with Brussels sprouts from Long Island. I want to learn how to make this at home. And then lamb comes from Malaysian fields in Pennsylvania uh, with turnips from Long Island, braised collards, and curried granola. 
That is some well-cooked, juicy lamb right there. So what are the advantages to farm to table? Uh, really, it's uh, a lot about the freshness. You just get better quality. Uh, it's more inspiring to work with. So you can tell dishes. when you cook? Yeah, and overall it's healthier, fresher, better product. Better tasting? Absolutely. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I uh, hope to see you again soon. Oh, I'll be back. Great. Next time you find yourself in the East Village, make sure to drop by Northern Spy Food Company. They offer delicious takes on fresh food and some of the most amazing vegetables I've ever had. You'll see what farm fresh really means if you stop by. Wow, I sure learned a lot this week. Not only about where our food comes from, but how to grow it too. Sure, NYC is short on space, but even a small window garden will let you grow things like herbs and even some vegetables that will add a little flavor to your meals. Check out these sites or visit your local garden store to learn more. I hope you had as much fun as I did this week, and don't forget to join us for the next episode of Dylan's Lunchbox.